I'm Helen Dawes and my background is physiotherapy. So we're going to just move a little bit here in our talking and, and discuss movement and exercise and its relation to um, thinking and cognition. Okay, so, um, so the title of the talk is um, Gait and Cognition, a Chicken and Egg Story. Okay. So movement, mobility, they are inherently linked to independence. They're very important to most individuals. Walking is an important functional um, activity. It's a very simple activity. When you walk, you just put one foot in front of the other foot and you take steps. And how fast you go will depend on the number of steps you take in a given time and how big those steps are. Um, it also allows you to balance, so it's important that your uh, feet are wide enough as you're walking uh, to give you a certain amount of security. It also gives us a, a certain amount of information uh, about individuals. So if you look at somebody's walk, you can see um, who they are. So if you're looking across a field and someone's walking towards you, you can tell who that person is, even when they're quite a distance away from their walk. We have quite distinct patterns of movement. It also can tell you what mood they're in. So if you've spotted your boss walking across the field towards you, uh, you can tell if they're in a mood, if they're quite um, stroppy. You can tell if somebody's depressed. You can also tell if they're ill. So I think there's a lot of information in the way we move. Now I've said it's quite simple. Walking is quite simple. But it's, is it automatic? When we actually are moving, you're not usually thinking about keeping on the move, but there is a, a lot of activity going on to try and keep you moving. And you can see this if you are walking and you want to look at some flowers or a bird, you'll often stop. It's quite hard to keep on the move whilst performing the act activity. And there's lots of famous sayings from ex-presidents of the United States about being able to walk and chew gum at the same time. So what is going on when you're walking? There's control mechanisms that we can measure. It's a, it's a system in your, in your body, it's a neurological system that controls your movement. And to put it into, into terms, there's three main levels. There's your brain, there's the spinal cord and the nerves coming down, and then there's your peripheral nerves. So how do we know this? We know all of this information because usually if something goes wrong, then you'll stop being able to move so well. So we know if we damage a part of the brain that you won't move so well. This isn't true of all, um, all um, animals, so we know that if we, I think, chop a head off a chicken, they can still move. But with humans, if we damage the brain, we know that we can't move so well. We also know that if you damage your spinal cord, that it can have devastating effects. And even if you um, damage a peripheral nerve, so we'll all have sat on our uh, bottoms on a hard seat for too long, and you'll, you'll feel like your legs have gone numb, and then when you get up, you move a little bit differently. Um, and that will have an impact on your walking. So moving around, there's a lot of activity going on. It's, it's hierarchical in that the brain's in, in charge, but it's also constant information that's coming from the top down and also from the bottom up, where all of your uh, parts of your body, your legs, the muscles, the joints, are constantly telling your brain where it is in space, where you are. So your eyes are feeding in, your um, balance is feeding in, and all of this enables you to move. Okay, so when we move, the neurological system's active. So this is where it starts to become interesting too, because we know now that moving, walking, exercise is good for you too. And we can now understand that while you're moving or while you're moving, all of the nervous system, the nerves, the brain is active, 
And we think from all of the evidence that this is good for your brain. So moving and walking is good for your brain. So if we think about the brain a little bit more, so that's a slice um, of a brain, and that's the outer layer of your brain, your cortex, and that is at the top, that's the front. So when you're moving around, when you're thinking of moving, so if you're walking across a room, you might see somebody which will give you the idea to move. You'll think, I want to go and see that person. Or in Claire's analogy, you then might see a, a hole or a step, and you might think, I want to move around that. So there's a certain amount of thinking going on. You might not be consciously aware of it. You might sometimes be aware of the fact you do want to go and see somebody across a room. But that information will be passed backwards. So it passed from the front of your brain, and it moves back to the motor areas of your brain, which are, if we look at this sort of picture here, it moves gradually back. This is all done very fast. And as you're moving, information as well about where you are, about the meaning of your movement is all going on as well. So your cortex is really active. And if we think about thinking, it's the areas of your brain that are also involved in planning and carrying out thinking tasks. And this can cause the bottleneck. So going back to being able to do two things at once, it this area of the brain, when you're moving, if you try and plan a task or think of things at the same time, there can be a, either a bottleneck or, if you like, a limit in your ability to do the task, which is why I find now, as I'm getting a little bit older and just thinking of ageing, um, that I can't juggle my car keys as I come out of the supermarket, carry my shopping bags and manage to flick the door open of the car. I'll tend to put the bags down and do it all a little bit slower. So what, what's going on when we age? Well, we, generally as we age, we know that all of these things decline. Yeah, so your muscles get gradually um, less, less strong, less good. Metabolic systems are less efficient. Cardiovascular systems. Everything is gradually getting worse. Your nerves are gradually declining as well. So to summarize it all up, it gradually becomes harder to move from a physical perspective and the control mechanism, the nerves, are less efficient at controlling you as well. So it, it's harder, it's more effort to perform activities. And that's true for even simple activities of walking. So in considering the research, what we thought we would do is have a look at trying to look at what's going on in, bra in the brain and the nerves whilst people were walking. So we started off with an ageing model. So we have looked at younger people and older people, and then we've looked at people with cognitive impairment. So that's what I'm going to just talk you through now. But it's not surprising, really, that even as we're getting older, the walking and movement is affected. OK, so this is how we did it. So we had a person wired up, so the, all of the um, activity, the reflexes were measured, and we also used a technique where we can shine a light into people's skulls. It's um, similar to what you use in special care baby units where you shine the light into areas of the brain and you look at which areas of the brain are active. And for this, I'm going to just present uh, data from people who, as they got older, um, and compare these individuals to people who were younger. This is the first part of what we did. And from that, you can just see which areas of the cortex are active. And we also could see what was going on with the reflexes. So what did we find? So when we're having a look at this, that's the sort of setup of, of how we set up the activity. And that's another model standing on the, on the treadmill. We used the treadmill for this, mainly because for my sanity um, of following people around with lots of wires on the ground, it's a little bit dangerous. So we used the treadmill for walking. Um, and what we found was that as people were older, their walking got a little bit slower, but in general, their actual style wasn't changed, unless they had something specifically wrong. Okay? <laughs> but we found that there was more activity in this frontal area of the brain. So this confirmed what everyone else had been saying, that there is more activity in the front of your, of your, of your brain 
you're using that area more. So we have more area, um, more activity to just walk when you're older, which perhaps explains in part why it's harder to do two things at once. And the other thing that we saw as well is if your, um, the frontal areas of your brain are more active, what they tend to do is dampen down your peripheral reflexes. So your reflexes in your limbs, which are normally quite active in keeping you safe, so that if you trip a little bit or you take a bigger step, they help to modulate. The frontal area of the brain seems to be dampening those down a little bit. And I'm um, not sure if that's a positive thing or a negative thing, but it's something that's happening. Okay, so to move this on a little bit now to looking at individuals with different forms of dementia. So we, we know lots of things, and this is from lots of researchers around the world, so that we know that as people get dementia, that it affects their movement. Obviously, it depends on how severe um, the, the, the symptoms are. But we know that different forms of dementia might affect different your movement in different ways. So some forms of dementia might affect the variability of your movement, make you a little bit more variable in how you move. Other forms of dementia might reduce the size of your steps, so you take slightly smaller steps. Uh, some of the movement disorders that are associated with dementia, like Parkinson's and Huntington's, you might take wider steps to help your balance as well. So we know there might be changes in the way um, people walk. So what we had a look at, and we're working with another group from um, the Whitehall um, uh, Oxford cohort and with uh, other individuals here in the room here, we had a look at people um, who were healthy controls and also at people who were beginning to show signs of, of, of mild cognitive impairment. Um, um, all we did is very simple, we just got people to walk. So we just got them to walk 10 metres and then to stop. Yep, it was very quick, five minutes. And we had a look at those individuals to see if their movement um, had changed at all. So a nice pretty slide. So can anyone remember what, what cadence was? Yeah, you can't see that, I can put another one up after. So the no cadence is the number of steps you take in a minute. So what we found, so looking at the top, is so the blue here are people with, um, without any cognitive impairment and the red here are people with some cognitive impairment. But we didn't find that having a mild cognitive impairment changed the number of steps that you take as you walk in a, in, a, in a certain given time. Now we had a look at the steps or strides. So a stride is two steps, so it's both feet moving. And what we did find there was that the people with cognitive impairment were reducing the length of their steps, so um, taking slightly smaller steps as they moved. We looked at the speed and in general there wasn't an impact on speed. So that's just the, the data there. So we found a difference with having mild cognitive impairment on the steps length that you people were taking. So what does this all mean, I suppose? What we know so far is that walking requires more brain activity as we age. It's more effort to walk. We know that as people are get mild cognitive impairment, that it might have an impact on the step length that they take or the steps they take. So it's having an impact on people's movement. Um, we know from other data from other groups that there is more cortical activity is likely to accompany this. So this is, is from Parkinson's disease and stroke as well. We also know that we can use walking and movement to detect subtle changes in how people are moving. And this might be useful for picking up uh, changes in people as, as they age, but also for picking up people um, with dementia and monitoring their movement as a marker of, ha of how they're doing, say, with therapies. So to bring us back to the sort of chicken and egg story, we do know that walking and activity is good for your brain, and hopefully, getting a feeling from this, this morning's talk as to why that is and why it has an impact.
but we don't know the optimal amount of walking that people should do, whether we should try and make people walk faster or allow people to walk for longer. But we do know that it's, it is good for you and is good for your thinking and impacting on that. So there's much to find out about optimal ways of exploring that to have an impact on people's health and well-being. We also know that as people with dementia may have problems with balance and coordination as well, and we hopefully have a bit of an understanding as to why that is, but what we need to do now is to explore kind of interventions that could help people's mobility and their walking, so help their, um, uh, appro their, the way that they move around uh, and make the way they walk a little bit safer and, and, and perhaps better for them. Okay, so I think that's it. So those are all the people that have been involved in, in this research. And then the, the last thing I'd like to say, if any of you are interested in exercise uh, or movement, uh, we are having an open day at Brooks, um, and I'll leave the slide up. And Alzheimer's Research UK have, are supporting the day. So we'll have lots of activities and lots of um, uh, uh, debates going on, but things that people can have a go at. So you can get your walking measured, uh, and you can have a go on treadmills and bicycles and various other physical things. <laughs> okay. So I want to think of a question, I'll ask the first one. Did you say you use techniques that shine light into the brain? Yeah, infrared, yeah. So, so uh, we use infrared spectroscopy, which is a technique that's been around for a long time in special care baby units, uh, units and they use it to, um, to see if there is blood in certain areas of the brain and that the baby's perfusing their brain. So we can use that as a technique to work out which areas of the brain are active uh, during activities. It's quite hard to do, to be honest. Other questions? <laughs> Keep your hand up. Yep, there's one there. Any on the other side as well? Stick your hand up, Brian, or come over. Have you found any differences in how the foot is actually placed on the ground that builds an artifice of that? Um, the reason I ask this is because it's really noticeable in my history. You always use a very slight way on the outside of these shoes. Yeah. Um, and now we go to two shoes in three months and the way it's all on the inside. That, that, <laughs> that's a really good question. Um, and so we think so. Um, and I think people sometimes walk less on their heels and start walking more on, on their toes, but it can depend. So we're actually looking, we've, we're measuring lots of people on different cohorts at the moment. So I think we've got GATE data coming in on about, I think, 6,000 individuals um, in the UK and also Canada and other places. So I might be able to answer that in, in a couple of years. So yeah, possibly. That's very interesting. Any other? Yep. Last question for Chaffee. I'm bound to say yes, aren't I? Because I'm, <laughs> I'm a physiotherapist. So um, I, think, I think so. I, it, we, everybody would say that moving is good for you and walking is good for you. So, and I think to take it the other way, it certainly won't do you any harm. So I think definitely, yeah. <laughs>